am I live? Possibly. It, is this working? This is very exciting. I haven't done this before. Let's see. Can anyone hear me? <laughs> oh, good. Someone said yes. Fantastic. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to make that a little brighter. Um, we'll see. If not, we're just going to do this in the dark. We'll call it art. Absurdist and awesome. Thank you. All right. Yes, I probably am pretty quiet. I will get a little closer to to the microphone, but you may just have to turn the volume off. All right. Yeah, we're just going to live with this picture. I don't know what's going on. Didn't look like this yesterday, but that's fine. Okay. So welcome to SACON 2019, an online Homestuck convention. After this, check out the Discord where there are a bunch of great panels and the Artist Alley and general chat shenanigans. Um, this is Behind the Curtain, a Theater of Cruelty Q&A. I'm Naked B. I made a movie version of Theater of Cruelty, the delightfully absurd fanfic written by Duckface, who is an entirely different person. Um, it's been really exciting to share my enthusiasm for this brilliant play with other people and to bask in the reflected joy as others experience it for the first time. Um, so why are we here today? I love going to film festivals and one of my favorite parts is when there's a Q&A with the director after the show. And so that's sort of what I'd like this panel to be. Um, a chance to share some behind the scenes stories with folks who are interested, answer questions that people have about filmmaking process. Um, we can probably talk about Detective Pony too, but I wanna talk about Theater of Cruelty first. Um, so I'm going to make one more attempt to get the, uh... oh, look, that picture all of a sudden got a lot better. So great. Now I can show off my little Kanaya t-shirt. Okay. Anyway, now I'm going to try to figure out this chat thing and start answering some questions. So let's see. Unraveling the mystery that is weird existential story. Yeah, that was a lie. I can't actually unravel it. Um, the inverted, inverted rhino. Actually, I think that's a reference to Theater Rhinoceros, which was Ionesco's theater, but I might be making that up. Um, one of the great things was that I had a little rhinoceros squishy toy, and so I was able to turn it upside down and just put it in there without thinking too much about the meaning. Um, was it a line of rhino related to death? All right. Yeah, let's see. Oh. Chat is very difficult. Let's see. Read the Pony Pals fanfic before watching the film. Yes, I definitely recommend that. The uh, Detective Pony novel is brilliant and amazing and um, should experience it as soon as possible rather than waiting for me to finish the movie. All right. What are my views on Detective Pony? Is it the world's greatest masterpiece or is it too revolutionary for our time? Let's just say both. Um, let's see. Wonder about the scenes where the stage floods and how much of a mess that made. Um, yeah, that uh, made a gigantic mess. I had to do it outside. Um, I started filming that scene at about 9 p.m. And I was like, okay, I just get one chance to flood the stage with water. So I turned on the hose and started pouring water everywhere and had a really just hectic time trying to film and move the dolls around and they'd fall into the water and uh, used a lot of just Eileen's tacky glue to glue their things onto them and everything would get wet and they would fall off. And that was, um, quite the comedy of errors, just running around by myself out in the backyard as uh, water went everywhere and glue went everywhere. Let's see, another question. How did I film the water flowing? Yeah, I just got a hose and put it through the curtain on the set and turned it on and hoped for the best. Um, it was pretty exciting. It was, it was fun to destroy something. <laughs> um, who were the Dirks? So... The Dirk dolls were like Barbie princess reporter Ken. Um, I bought one of those at Toys R Us and then bought three identical ones online afterwards. 
um, in terms of who were the, the puppeteers, I didn't know how long it would take to film. So I've been planning for a little while and I invited some friends over for dinner and like, oh, we're going to start this project. And none of them had read Homestuck. None of them knew what it was, but they were always up for weird art projects. So um, fed them dinner. We went outside. We put uh, water in the horse sculptures for the first time and water went everywhere all over the set. So we mopped that up really quickly and I said, okay, you guys eat dessert. I'll put some more glue on. And then we just splashed water artfully around the horses. Um, we started filming and at the end of the first hour, we had done approximately a minute and a half of the 20 minute movie. And I realized that we were, we were not going to finish it that night. Um, it turns out even with Barbie dolls and not having to have people memorize their lines, um, there's still a lot of blocking and rehearsal we should have done. So I quickly uh, scribbled through and figured out, okay, there's just this one scene with the chairs moving around, I guess the two more chair scenes. Um, and so they, uh, we did that part, a lot of nice improv. Um, I want to shout out my friend Barb for doing the chair hat thing. I think that's hilarious. Um, and then they went home. And so it was actually a month of other filming, just me for a couple of hours every night, just moving the Barbies around. Um, so it has the illusion of being a lot of people involved, but it's actually just four people for a couple hours, one night, and then me the whole rest of the time filling in the other scenes. All right. Now I'm going to go through another question. Um, What's your personal history with theater, especially the sort of theater of cruelty is inspired by? So I was in my first play when I was five. I was a munchkin in The Wizard of Oz. That, that was really fun. And so I did uh, community theater every summer growing up. I went to college and joined a theater company, directed a few plays there. And that's when I decided that, oh, acting was neat but directing was just a real thrill. Uh, so I got to be one of the characters in The Bald Soprano, a play by Ionesco, and Absurdist Theater was really fun. And we had a good time talking about uh, Theater of Cruelty, which is where, as far as I understand it, um, the goal was just to make the audience physically very uncomfortable, like you put them all in really terrible chairs or you make them sit backwards or you play loud noises. And that just seemed awful, but in a really fun way. Um, and so, yeah, I actually do a lot of theater, but just as a hobby activity um, and directing is, is fun. So when I saw something that combined Homestuck, which I really liked with absurdist theater, with fan fiction, I was very excited. Um, all right, let me look for another question. Let's see, what was your process like for planning your film of Theater of Cruelty? So, and then I'll also get to the next question, how did you choose Ken Dolls as your choice of medium? So it started with reading uh, Duckface's fanfic and just, just loving it so much. It was so weird and it was so angry and it was so Dirk in a good way, um, and it was mad at Hussey, but very cleverly putting him, in, I don't know, I, I liked it a lot. And so I just obsessively read it for a while, a few weeks, and um, I thought, well, how, how would I do a theatrical performance of that? That would be really great. Would it be best to get four identical looking people and then have them rehearse? Would it be best to uh, get four people who look wildly different and just put them in bad wigs and identical t-shirts. And I really was thinking of it as a live performance with real human beings because all of my work to that point had been with that. Um, and you know, I was like, well, it'd be really disappointing if the water at the end was just a bunch of blue fabric or if it were all CGI'd afterwards as some sort of fake water. Uh, Cause I thought that, flooding the, the stage was, was really the, the big, the big set piece um, for the, for the thing. And so after honestly a couple of months of trying to figure out how to do it as a real traditional movie um, for some of my other films, I'd learned from 
Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings DVD commentaries that he planned the big battle scenes for Helm's Deep with little army men and Barbie dolls and action figures. And so I'd been doing that as a process for a long time to work out the blocking for uh, theatrical work and movie work. And I was like, oh, I could just get four identical Ken dolls and I could get like a kiddie pool or something and fill that with water. Yeah, this is gonna work. So for the next couple of days, every time anyone talked to me, they were like, well, you know, how are you doing? And I'd be like, do you know I could get a kiddie pool and I could flood the stage? And that was really exciting. Um, so that's why dolls, because it just unlocked how am I actually going to make this thing happen that I want to happen. Um, I could do it with dolls. And so when I started filming, I was trying to be like, well, are they going to you know, puppet them? Am I going to stop motion? So I just filmed a couple of test scenes and practiced. And I I liked the puppeting of the dolls. That seemed hilarious. Um, at first, I kept, tried to keep my hands out of the the shot. But then um, watching myself whenever the hand would accidentally get in, I thought that was super funny. And so I like jokes. So I left it in. Uh, let's see. How long did Theater of Cruelty take to produce? Now that I wrote down somewhere. So I could just look at it. Let's see. So I started planning the audiobook in October of 2015 because I also was like, well, I'm not sure if I'm actually going to go through with this project. It seems really big. Um, maybe I'll just do an audiobook. And if I successfully complete that, then that shows I'm committed enough and I'll, I'll do the next bit. Um, so I did the audiobook October to December. So just a couple months there. And then I posted that in January. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the audiobook is I'm not a fantastic voice actor, and I really wanted to do different voices for the different Dirks, but I kept getting mixed up on whose accent was which and had trouble switching back and forth. Um, so I just made one script that was all of Dirk 1's lines and was able to do that voice. Another script that was all Dirk 2 lines and just did all of those in a row and then edited them later to make myself seem more talented than I was. Um, so I'm a big fan of those kinds of the, the cheating that digital media lets you do. Anyway, um, so I started planning the video as soon as I posted the audiobook. Then a couple months later in April of 2016, I started making sets and props. And that was really fun just to have a reason to do a lot of different crafts. Um, started filming on June 3rd, 2016. And I finished filming July 2nd, 2016. So about a month of, of filming. Um, and then a couple weeks of editing posted on July 6th. So let's see, October to July, whatever that is, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten 10 months. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Now I'm going to scroll back through some more questions. Um, Yeah, the recommendation to look up a guy named Arto, uh, French name Artaud. I don't know if you want to read more about it. He seems like an interesting and really maybe sort of awful person, but like I would have really liked to see those plays <laughs> or more. I want to see plays inspired by that guy, but funnier and geekier. Um, let's see. All right. Let's see. Theater of Cruelty. Yes, Theater of Cruelty is a pun on Theater of Cruelty. Do I have like five arms? Um, yeah, like I said, the a couple of the shots were done with multiple people who I invited over to help me. And um, the hilarious thing is that none of them have still read Homestuck. They, they were just like, no, we're just happy to do this. Um, but uh, all of the rest of it is just done with me and, and one of the great things about filmmaking as opposed to theater is I've got, I've got two arms and if they come in from different parts of the screen, I can move two characters at once. Um, I think sometimes I tried to move three characters at once. Like I had to stick my leg up on the table and was moving one, but that often didn't, didn't work out very well. So it's mostly just two things at once or one thing at once and just fast cutting between them. So this person moves and then this person moves. And in your mind, you blend it all together, but really there's not too many things moving at a time. 
Um, let's see. You made that all by yourself. I honestly thought there was a team behind it. Yeah, that's actually something I wanted to to mention is that it does seem like people assume that there's a, a whole bunch of folks um, involved. But I would, I mean, other than the duck face had to be the one to to write it, which puts a lot of the, the content in there as far as the filmmaking part. Um, yeah, it was it was like three hours other people and I don't know, a hundred hours me. And one of the things I like about hobby fan works is, is that you can just do stuff and it doesn't matter how long it takes you to do it because people will still be interested in it later whenever you post it. Um, and it can take as long as it takes. There's not a, not a deadline when it has to be done. Um, so that's fun. Let's see. That was outside. Yeah. Um, did it out on the back patio just to have a place I could set things up and leave them there all month. Uh, the good thing is I live in California where we don't particularly have weather. So that was very convenient. Um, we're the only person working the set for, for most of it. Um, except for that one first night, I was the only person working on the set. What helped me pull off the enigmatic atmosphere so well? Framing, tone styling, whew. I mean, I watch a lot of weird movies. Mm, that's all I got. Also, I do think one thing that influenced a lot of the choices is I tried to buy as little stuff as possible. Um, most of the things involved in the set were stuff from my garage. The blue backdrop uh, were solar panels in a, I don't know, medievalist punk, weird Sir Gawain and the Green Knight project I did a couple years previously. The wood had been from a production of The Importance of Being Earnest. The blue curtains had been from another uh, medieval, like King Arthur costume from something else. And so just finding random junk and putting it together, I think ends up with something more eclectic looking than if I'd sat down and designed it and went out and bought the things, then it's only as good as my imagination where that element of randomness and serendipity adds a lot. At least that's my thought. All right. Hmm. Let's see. I don't remember the Dirks having different voices, so I look forward to rewatching it. They are a little subtle. Um, I mean, they're all, I, I tried less to do accents and more to do ways that I would talk. So there's that. Um, was there anything way more difficult than you thought to produce in TOC? Um, hmm, that is a fantastic question. What was difficult? Okay, something that was just very silly, like the the fireplace, I thought that would be very easy. It was like, oh, I'll just draw something, um, black and white paper, print it out, fold it together, tape it to the back. That was actually really hard. I did like five iterations of that silly fireplace to actually get it three-dimensional and to wrap around. And then even when I did do it, like the bricks didn't didn't line up because I wasn't super careful with the rubber cement and gluing it down to the cardboard. And I was like, ah, I did that on purpose. It really looks shoddy and like a JPEG artifact in real life, but really I just uh, had trouble. Um, let's see, how did you get Duckface to do narration for Detective Pony? And what was your initial reaction to the story, especially the later chapters? Oh, so this I have to confess, I'm just a terrible internet stalker. Um, so I'd been trying to find out as much as I could about Duckface because I didn't ask for permission before doing Theater of Cruelty. I just did it and hoped that he wouldn't be mad. Um, so I found that he and his roommate used to do, a, I guess still do a, a podcast called Trucks uh, where they talk about video games and art and Homestuck. And I listened to that while doing the props. And so then at some point, while making Theater of Cruelty, um, my partner had moved to New York and uh, Duckface mentioned that his rock band was gonna be playing a show nearby. So I sent my partner out to see it. 
and he showed up. And the way I remember the story, it maybe didn't really go like this. Um, they, they looked out from their show and they saw their friends and this random dude. And so then when they walked over after the show, they're like, oh, hey, how did you find our show? And he says, oh, you know, my wife's a fan of yours. She's been following you online. I'm like, oh, is that Naked Bee? <laughs> Since I uh, had watched all the videos and they, they had noticed. Um, so then the next day, I sent a link to Theater of Cool Tea and said, I hope you like this weird movie I have made of your fanfic. And um, for my next project, I'm doing Detective Pony. Would you like to be the voice of Dirk? And he said, yes. Um, so then a few months later, we actually were able to meet and he'd been sending me chapters um, as he recorded them with very little direction. I just said, oh, you should just record them. Um, and he did, he's a great actor, which I feel like I got really, really lucky. Um, and he did a fantastic job. And so then the first time we met was when we uh, recorded chapter 11. And so that's why it sounds so, so different. There's a point where it says, thanks for getting rid of the italics. Um, that's the first time we were actually in the same room together and speaking to each other. So there's a real live dynamic there. Um, let's see. You're the most powerful director, Alpha Dave. I really, <laughs> really like reading about Alpha Dave. Um, yeah, I get very inspired about thinking about him that, that in the Alpha timeline, Alpha Dave and I would perhaps be the same age and have come up watching all the same indie movies and admiring a lot of the same directors. So I like that. Let's see. Have you shown your production to friends who like their absurdist theater? What did they think of it? Yeah, when I show it to people, they're like, oh, what have you been working on? I'm like, well, have you heard of Homestuck? And they never have. So I show it to them anyway. And they mostly say that the, the jokes come through as absurdist and then towards the end of the stuff with Hussey, they they realize that they're jokes they're not getting, but they can understand, oh, well, this is the author character. This is the death of the author. They, that all comes through pretty well. So I think it's a, a tribute to Duckface's writing that they can get as much out of it. Um, even though obviously I think the fantastic thing about fanfic is it can be so much richer because it's building on layers and layers and layers and layers. All right. How did I make the horse? Um, so actually somewhere up on my Tumblr, maybe I'll reblog it, is a tutorial of how I made the horse because that was super fun. Um, I bought a plastic horse. I took a hacksaw and cut it into several pieces. I bought four plastic boxes and then glued the horse parts into the box and then hung it up on a little wooden structure that I'd made. Where did I get all the identical chairs? Uh, eBay, I think. Um, there are a lot of Barbie miniature parts you can get on eBay for very inexpensive, especially with long shipping times coming over from China. I think a dozen chairs were $3. So you too can have your very own chairs. <laughs> Try Barbie chairs on, on eBay. It's my recommendation. Um, do, do, do. Oh, this is very sweet. My partner and I have watched Theater of Cool Tea at least 20 to 30 times, and we always find the little details to spark our interest more. That is very sweet. Thank you very much. Um, did the Dirk Dolls play along, or did their glasses and stick-on hats fall off a lot? Though so They fell off all the time. So um, let me be right back. You know, in that way that... Pet owner shame. They're saying this is one of the, the Dirk dolls. I guess this is original Dirk. Here he is without orange triangle glasses. Because I would say that those little pieces of plastic that I stuck on with glue never stayed attached for more than about twelve hours in a row. Um, so one of the things I, whenever I watch the video, that I can't help but noticing are when I the glue dries clear, but it's white when you've put it on. And I often was too impatient to wait for it to dry. So I would glue their little glasses back on and so you can still see the white border around. That means their glasses just fell off and I had to glue them back on. All right. Every time I watched, I feel so sorry for the fireplace. Like, oh no, it's getting wet. 
Oh, the fireplace is also doing very well. Um, for whatever reason, the fireplace um, has managed to survive intact. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, it held up very, very sturdily. You know, it's just some foam and some sculpy clay fireplace. So, so the fireplace was not harmed by getting lost in the flood. And that little uh, circle thing that it does around the, that was just, I was really excited by that. And that was an absolute accident um, because at that time I'm standing behind the set with um, the hose of water and I can't see anything that's happening. The camera's filming, but I'm not looking at it. And it was actually the next day looking at the, the footage to see what I'd gotten that I found that bit and was able to include it. Let's see. Although now that I see fireplace, yeah, the paper fireplace was was dead. Um, the fire inside was okay, which is you know, a little counterintuitive. Kelly Starr says, trucks, yay, trucks. <laughs> um, oh, now I scrolled too far. Let's see. Do, do, do. Let's see. Are you going to make anything after Detective Pony? Whew. I'm not allowed to think about that until after I've finished Detective Pony. Um, I definitely find that if I get too excited about the next project, it's harder to finish the current project. So for the next six months to a year, it's all Detective Pony. But after that, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, let's see. What parts of the comic have really made you a fan of Homestuck? Oh. So I will tell my Homestuck journey story because I think it is very silly. Um, I was on AO3, Archive of Our Own, looking for fanfic. And at the time, I was really into reading about hockey. So I was browsing by fandom, which isn't something I think I ever do anymore. But at the time, I was browsing by fandom. I clicked on H. Um, I was looking for hockey, and I saw right next to it this thing that said Homestuck, and I'd never heard of that, but it had something like 100,000 fix. I really like fanfic. So I was just like, well, how can there be something that I've never heard of that has 100,000 fanfic? So that that's just absurd. So I clicked through and um, just clicked on a random fic and I really liked it. I didn't know what a Psyllidex was. I didn't know who Tentacle Therapist was. I was pretty sure she was an alien. Um, and I thought that would be great, that there would be aliens and video games. And one of the characters was from Texas and I'm from Texas. And that also seemed super great. Um, so I was like, well, let me Google what this Homestuck thing is. And then I got to a page that wanted me to enter a name and I didn't want to give it my name. So I just left. I was like, well, let me go read some more fanfics. And they were also really good. So a month or two later, I said, well, let me give that Homestuck thing a try again. I thought it seemed a little weird. And so then I got as far as maybe, again, the, the enter name screen or reading something about it. And I said, oh, it's a video game. Well, I don't like video games. I don't like fun or games. Um, I won't read it. And... It really, like, like I'm not sure how many times I went back, but it was at least three times before I finally just tried clicking the enter name link and seeing that it went to another page and it was just a webcomic. Um, so I felt very dumb once I figured out that it was just an HTML link and not actually an interactive, like, login screen where I had to have an account. Um, but then I started reading it and what did I like about it? I, I loved the format um, as, a, as an adventure story about kids who do something and it turns out to be real. Oh my goodness. Like that was all really great. Um, but what I thought was super, super special was the use of gifts in a web comic, right? I had read and absorbed all those Scott McCloud books about how the internet would allow new kinds of comics, but they could be outside the panel but I hadn't actually read any comics that took advantage of the internet as an art form. And as 
many people have said much more eloquently than I can, um, Homestuck is native to the internet in a way that other things weren't. And I just found that so heady and exciting. Um, so that's what drew me in and made me super excited about reading the comic. But then once I had gotten far enough, I just fell in love with everybody, right? Um, I love Kanaya, I love Carcat, I love Dirk. I just really like all of them and want to read more stories about them having a good time. I'm actually sort of a wimp and I like people to be happy. I like people to be heroic. I like things to end well. And uh, that's mostly what I'm into for fiction, especially if it has like a magical or speculative element to it. Also, it's super gay, which was just very pleasing because none of the other fandoms that I've been a fan of have been so explicitly gay. Like I felt like before Homestuck, there was always this big divide between pop culture stuff I was fanish about and the gay only came in the fanfic versus queer media that I was watching. And it was all very artistic and cool, but but even in current queer cinema, there's still so much tragedy and suicide. It's so rare to find speculative fiction, queer cinema um, that, that Homestuck was just really watering that part of me. All right, now let's scroll some more. Oh, this one says, since I know Duckface is watching it, are you watching Sarah and Mai or have you watched Utena? I have not watched Sarah and Mai, although that sounds interesting. Um, I did watch Utena because Duckface uh, was blogging about it under his uh, some triangles, two triangles, uh, Tumblr handle. And at first I was just reading his lines like, oh yeah, I've watched some anime, that seems okay. And as he kept describing this show episode by episode, I was like, well, well wait, what is this? Why haven't I heard about this? And uh, when I found that U uh, Utena was on YouTube for free, I lost a whole weekend watching it because that was exactly my brand of absurdist, dark, but ultimately at least the, the way I interpreted it, hopeful uh, story. Nanami and the Elephants just made me jump around. I definitely rewatched a lot of the student council scenes um, to get inspiration for Detective Pony. So we'll see how those translate. But uh, yeah, Revolutionary Girl Atena was just a revelation and I will thank Duckface for recommending that. Let's see. What would you say are your biggest fanish influences? Um, so my first fandom was Lord of the Rings. Uh, I was working on a collaborative queer theater project and we'd gotten to uh, a certain very, I guess I was gonna say homoerotic, but gay scene. And someone's like, oh, if you like that, you'll probably like this random Lord of the Rings fanfic. And fanfic was really great. It was n not something I'd seen where those geeky and queer parts uh, had come together before. Um, and then through Lord of the Rings, I got into Harry Potter. Through Harry Potter, I started going to conventions. And through conventions, I hooked up with, sometimes they call themselves media fandom, um, fans of Star Trek and Starsky and Hutch and sort of the classic TV stuff. And those mostly women have been a huge influence in my life. Like at this point, a lot of my real life friends are from those, those groups. And it was one of the first social spaces where I had a lot of older women as role models. Um, just, just these fantastic like fandom elders who were super geeky and super technical and super happy and super interested in stuff. And that, I don't know, that was super great. So I would say at this point, my biggest Spanish influence is that corner of a fandom and whatever they're into. I'm like, oh, this sounds good too. All right, let's see. Now I'm gonna look for another thing. Oh, do, 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 do. There are so many comments, it is hard to read. Let's see, do, do, do. I love the Kanaya shirt. I really, <laughs> yeah, I love this as well. I'm just gonna. Feature this again. Okay, great. Um, 
Now the boring part where I just scroll through comments. Yay, just more more truck stuff. I really do recommend Euro Talk Simulator trucks. It's almost impossible to Google, but if you do find it, it's fantastic. Maybe I'll post some to Tumblr later. Um, do I have a professional background in theater? What do I do for a living? Love your work. Greetings from Germany. Hello, greetings from Germany. I went to Bavaria for the first time for work recently, and someone was telling me that Bavaria is like the Texas of Germany, and that seemed really true in a lot of ways that I found hard to take, but also really comforting. Like everything that I ate there was amazing. Um, but let's see. Professional background in theater? No, um, I've only done theater as an amateur. I did minor in Shakespearean production, but that makes it sound a lot fancier than it actually was. Um, and what do I do for a living? So I'm an engineer, mechanical engineer. So I like making things and uh, doing arts and crafts kind of stuff. Um, I think the one thing I'll say about what I do for a living is my Tumblr header, uh, building a factory to resurrect the dead is a whimsical, if literal, interpretation of my day job. Um, I get to do a lot of sewing. I get to do a lot of math. Um, I get to make charts and graphs. I get to work with my hands. I get to glue things. I have a laser cutter. Um, so that's super fun. It's been neat how the fandom stuff and the work stuff go back and forth for each other. Um, I learned how to do molding and casting in silicone for fandom stuff and then got an opportunity to make some anatomical models of, of kidneys uh, at work. I learned how to do video so I could videotape some clinical procedures um, and then was like, oh, this video stuff is easier than I thought it was. Let's, let's do more videos. And that's when I bought a, a camera for myself was after doing stuff at work. So it's been fun to have those go back and forth. Um, I don't know if anyone needs a, a life path. I do recommend engineering as much cooler than it sounds. Like I don't think there've been enough movies about engineering. Cause I will say that I get most of my, who do I idolize? What do I want to be from movies? And uh, so for the longest time I watched space camp, which came out in the eighties and I was like, well, I'll be an astronaut. But then I worked at a defense company for a little bit and that was super not what I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I recommend engineering as a lot more arts and crafts than I had been led to believe. Um, so it's pretty fun to be engineers. Let's see. What is my least favorite aspect of Homestuck? Anything sad that happens. I mean, right, when, when people die, I am sad and angry. <laughs> when people are not nice to other people, I get sad. Um, which, which is tough, right? Like I really like film, I really like books and TV, but I'm constantly, I want AO3 warnings. <laughs> All right, um, let's see, opinion on the epilogues. Yeah, they made me so sad. <laughs> I don't think I have more profound things to say than that. Uh, let's see. Lots of love for the fireplace and the fire. Someone asked what hockey fandom is like. Um, it was really great. I played sports, but I'd never been much of a professional sports fan. Um, although I will say that as a fandom, <clears throat> I'd gotten really used to responding to the way a fictional narrative would progress. Um, there's someone writing it and they can make choices that you don't like or that you do like, and you can dislike them and their choices. But with following a sports team, sometimes you really want them to win and it would make a great story if they did win. And then they don't. And everyone is very sad. Sometimes people get injured and not for some great like narrative arc or with meaning, 
but just because they got hit in the head really hard and then have to take a year off and uh, not play hockey. And that's very sad. So, so I, I, I did find hockey fandom actually super stressful, but just because no one was writing this thing, this is just the universe. Um, and constantly checking to see whether my team was scoring points or not was just really terrible. Uh, so, so I mostly am in uh, fictional fandoms because at least someone is in charge and I have a, a higher chance of a happy ending. Um, do, do, do. Let's see. Oh, good. Someone else thought it was a, Homestuck was a game first, too. I just, yeah. I, I cannot believe it took me so long to figure out that it was just a one comic. Like, I don't, I don't think I ever tried to Google, like, what is Homestuck. I just kept going to MS Paint Adventures and looking at that first page and going, nope, all right, I think I got to give up. Um, oh, no, I love this story. I used to think MS Paint Adventures was a website where you could submit silly paint drawings, and I couldn't find the submit button and left. <sighs> yeah, I feel you. <laughs> what is my favorite part of Theater of Cruelty? Who? I don't know. I mean, it, yeah. So another thing that that I feel guilty for admitting, but I'm just going to admit, like I, after I made that, I just listened to it on repeat all the time, just falling asleep. Then I'd wake up and I'd listen to it some more. Sure, it's my own voice. I don't care. I got over that. I just listen to it a lot. Also on Twitter, I really like the Theater of Cruelty bot that just tweets a line from Theater and Cruelty, uh, Theater of Cruelty every half an hour. Um, I find that very satisfying. I laugh out loud every time I check Twitter because it just interspersed with all of the, you know, terrible political news, sometimes some fan art, Theater of Cruelty. Um, oh, what's my favorite part? No, I don't know. I just really like everything about it. Honestly, the literalization of the death of the author joke is very funny. Um, I I like that he turned into hussy. I didn't see that coming reading through it the first time. I definitely was going to a Lord English place and just the way that that broke the fourth wall or even broke the fourth wall within the fourth wall because hussy had already come into the comic at that point. I don't know. It was hilarious. All right. Let's see. All right, now I'm scrolling down. Do I read Check, Please? Oh, yes, I do read Check, Please. Check, Please is a fantastic webcomic about hockey boys, and um, they're all safely fictional, and so mostly nice things happen to them. Yes, I really, really do love that. Um, in Detective Pony, what is one thing you're really excited to make have already made? <sighs> so the thing that's next on the list is um, the Pharmacon rant, which I feel like I might not be smart enough to understand, uh, but I really like whenever I listen to it, I get different visual images. So I'm having trouble coalescing on what one visual image I want to do. Um, for unrelated reasons, my dad gave me a dollhouse recently. So I will probably just take that serendipity and use the dollhouse and the pharmacon somehow. So, so I am excited to see what that will look like when it's done in a couple of months, even though right now I can't really envision what that's going to be like. Um, the part that I was most intimidated to do was Long Cat. Um, it's definitely one of the most famous parts of Detective Pony. And so I feel, I don't know, just really stressed and anxious about how people are going to go into it. Um, and mostly my thought there now that it's uh, predominantly nailed down is, you know what happens early on? And Dirk is, Dirk the fictional filmmaker in this is just getting his feet. And so it's okay if it's a little shaky or, or weird. This is the first time he's really trying to sort of stretch the narrative wings. 
All right. Can I say hi to your friend Nick Gers? He is your biggest fan. Well, hi, Nick Gers. Uh, let's see. Let's look at the camera and say, hi, Nick. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yay. Let's see. So now we're all long cat rant. Yeah. I, I, I like the rants. I like Duckface's performance of the rants. Um, I also just... Now that Detective Pony has the audiobook, just listen to that over and over again. And sometimes I'm like, oh, yes, I am going to be planning for the film. Let me put that on and listen to it and just think about the images. And then an hour later, I'll realize I've just been listening to it and laughing along at the jokes and not actually doing any of the work part. So, so that's, that's a hazard. Um, let's see. I actually haven't heard Long Cat. Where can I hear it? Um, my YouTube channel. So after this stream is done, I think there's a playlist of all the Detective Pony audiobook parts. Um, also, if you just go through uploads. So it's in chapter three, but I do recommend starting at the beginning so you get the whole performance. Let's see, let's see what else we got. Big Mood is having to Google what Pharmacon is while reading fanfic. Yeah, I had to look so much stuff up, but that's part of the, the fun. Um, I really like when I learn that something has a whole language that I don't know. Um, it seems like a fun challenge to figure it out. Uh, this, this weekend, I learned the term post-structuralism and have been trying to figure out what that means. I feel like I'm just starting the journey there and seems to be something a lot of people uh, use unironically and something that people only use dismissively about others. <laughs> so while I haven't quite figured out what it is, um, it's, it's just been fun to see the sort of salt and memes and arguments that people are having about post-structuralism with each other. And then just from that to try to figure out what it must be because reading academic papers, eh, I'm not sure I'm really going to do that, but I like the kind of puzzle hunting that happens when you just get the discourse and try to figure out what the original problem was. All right. When he starts speaking Greek, I cry. Yeah. Um, my and I think something that I got really blessed by was since we were working uh, remotely, he was just, you know, I said, hey, why don't you record so, record the voice? And he just started doing it and sending me the files, which is really fantastic. Um, I had assumed that he wouldn't speak the Greek and I would just put the Greek text on the screen while the English happened. But it turns out that uh, Duckface is very smart, especially with languages, and just did the Greek part. And I really love that. Um, doo, doo, doo. Yeah, just straight up Greek. Is it ever possible to get a download for the Detective Pony audiobook or even the lines of Theater of Cruelty? So, so if you go to the AO3 page for both Detective Pony and Theater of Cruelty, um, I think I have a link to Box, so you can just download them as MP3s. Uh, if you don't want to listen to them streaming on YouTube. Those are basically the two places they're, they're hosted. Let's see, since I prefer happy endings, what did you think of the epilogues and Dirk's portrayal, especially in relation to your work? I, yeah, I mean, I, I read the epilogues and I just cried all day. <laughs> um, in relation to my, I, I did think the orange text, oh my goodness. So there's my alarm saying we've got 10 minutes left to go. Um, so I will start to wrap up so you have plenty of time to walk over to the other window and go to your other panels. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, I actually found the epilogues really, really tough. And I thought it was interesting that they carried on the same orange text device that had started in Homestuck in the, those first two pages of Detective Pony and took them in such a different direction than Sonnet Stuck did with uh, his version of Detective Pony, which, uh, yeah. I, I don't think I'm going to make a movie of the epilogues because um, I love Detective Pony 
as uh, the fanfic so much. Let's see. What was I saying about the orange text? Yeah. Have I read the serendipity gospels? I have not. Should I? What is that? One thing that's been really fantastic about this Stuck at Home Con is I've been seeing a lot of people like, let me tell you about uh, Vast Error or uh, all of these other fan works that I didn't know about. So I've definitely got my reading list planned out for the next couple months. So if there's something I should uh, be looking at, let me know. I will check it out. All right. So yeah, the alarm has gone off. Um, I don't know. So one last question before I go, which epilogue did you prefer? Yeah, like I said, I, I, I read, I think I read Candy first and then Meet second. Um, and I was just devastated by both of them, honestly. <laughs> I feel like such a wuss. But, uh, but yeah, that was my response. Um, so yes, Sandy. The Gospels is a really good Gamrezi fic. Yes, you should read the Serenity Gospels if you like Troll Culture at all, which really up your alley. Well, that sounds great. I will I will try that. All right, thank you all for joining me for this Theater of Cruelty Q&A and being so nice and welcoming. All right, I'm going to sign off pretty soon, and I will see you all on the internet. All right, bye.